Section 5 of The Soul of Man by Oscar Wilde. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Section 5. In old days men had the rack. Now they have the press. That is an improvement, certainly but still it is very bad and wrong and demoralising somebody was it burke called journalism the fourth estate that was true at the time no doubt but at the present moment it really is the only estate it has eaten up the other three the lords temporal say nothing the lords spiritual have nothing to say and the house of commons has nothing to say and says it we are dominated by journalism in america the president reigns for four years and journalism governs for ever and ever fortunately in america journalism has carried its authority to the grossest and most brutal extreme as a natural consequence it has begun to create a spirit of revolt people are amused by it or disgusted by it according to their temperaments but it is no longer the real force it was it is not seriously treated in england journalism not except in a few well-known instances having been carried to such excesses of brutality is still a great factor a really remarkable power the tyranny that it proposes to exercise over people's private lives seems to me to be quite extraordinary the fact is that the public have an insatiable curiosity to know everything except what is worth knowing journalism conscious of this and having tradesmanlike habits supplies their demands in centuries before ours the public nailed the ears of journalists to the pump that was quite hideous in this century journalists have nailed their own ears to the keyhole that is much worse and what aggravates the mischief is that the journalists who are most to blame are not the amusing journalists who write for what are called society papers the harm is done by the serious thoughtful earnest journalists who solemnly as they are doing at present will drag before the eyes of the public some incident in the private life of a great statesman of a man who is a leader of political thought as he is a creator of political force and invite the public to discuss the incident to exercise authority in the matter to give their views and not merely to give their views but to carry them into action to dictate to the man upon all other points to dictate to his party to dictate to his country in fact to make themselves ridiculous offensive and harmful the private lives of men and women should not be told to the public the public have nothing to do with them at all in france they manage these things better there they do not allow the details of the trials that take place in the divorce courts to be published for the amusement or criticism of the public all that the public are allowed to know is that the divorce has taken place and was granted on petition of one or other or both of the married parties concerned in france in fact they limit the journalist and allow the artist almost perfect freedom here we allow absolute freedom to the journalist and entirely limit the artist english public opinion that is to say tries to constrain and impede and warp the man who makes things that are beautiful in effect and compels the journalist to retail things that are ugly or disgusting or revolting in fact so that we have the most serious journalists in the world 
and the most indecent newspapers it is no exaggeration to talk of compulsion there are possibly some journalists who take a real pleasure in publishing horrible things or who being poor look to scandals as forming a sort of permanent basis for an income but there are other journalists i feel certain men of education and cultivation who really dislike publishing these things who know that it is wrong to do so and only do it because the unhealthy conditions under which their occupation is carried on oblige them to supply the public with what the public wants and to compete with other journalists in making that supply as full and satisfying to the gross popular appetite as possible it is a very degrading position for any body of educated men to be placed in and i have no doubt that most of them feel it acutely however let us leave what is really a very sordid side of the subject and return to the question of popular control in the matter of art by which i mean public opinion dictating to the artist the form which he is to use the mode in which he is to use it and the materials with which he is to work i have pointed out that the arts which have escaped best in england are the arts in which the public have not been interested they are however interested in the drama and as a certain advance has been made in the drama within the last ten or fifteen years it is important to point out that this advance is entirely due to a few individual artists refusing to accept the popular want of taste as their standard and refusing to regard art as a mere matter of demand and supply with his marvellous and vivid personality with a style that has really a true colour element in it with his extraordinary power not over mere mimicry but over imaginative and intellectual creation mr irving had his sole object been to give the public what they wanted could have produced the commonest plays in the commonest manner and made as much success and money as a man could possibly desire but his object was not that his object was to realize his own perfection as an artist under certain conditions and in certain forms of art at first he appealed to the few now he has educated the many he has created in the public both taste and temperament the public appreciate his artistic success immensely i often wonder however whether the public understand that that success is entirely due to the fact that he did not accept their standard but realized his own with their standard the lyceum would have been a sort of second-rate booth as some of the popular theatres in london are at present whether they understand it or not the fact however remains that taste and temperament have to a certain extent been created in the public and that the public is capable of developing these qualities the problem then is why do not the public become more civilized they have the capacity what stops them the thing that stops them it must be said again is their desire to exercise authority over the artist and over works of art to certain theatres such as the lyceum and the haymarket the public seem to come in a proper mood in both of these theatres there have been individual artists who have succeeded in creating in their audiences and every theatre in london has its own audience the temperament to which art appeals and what is that temperament it is the temperament of receptivity that is all if a man approaches a work of art with any desire to exercise authority over it and the artist 
he approaches it in such a spirit that he cannot receive any artistic impression from it at all the work of art is to dominate the spectator the spectator is not to dominate the work of art the spectator is to be receptive he is to be the violin on which the master is to play and the more completely he can suppress his own silly views his own foolish prejudices his own absurd ideas of what art should be or should not be the more likely he is to understand and appreciate the work of art in question this is of course quite obvious in the case of the vulgar theatre-going public of english men and women but it is equally true of what are called educated people for an educated person's ideas of art are drawn naturally from what art has been whereas the new work of art is beautiful by being what art has never been and to measure it by the standard of the past is to measure it by a standard on the rejection of which its real perfection depends a temperament capable of receiving through an imaginative medium and under imaginative conditions new and beautiful impressions is the only temperament that can appreciate a work of art and true as this is in the case of the appreciation of sculpture and painting it is still more true of the appreciation of such arts as the drama for a picture and a statue are not at war with time they take no count of its succession in one moment their unity may be apprehended in the case of literature it is different time must be traversed before the unity of effect is realized and so in the drama there may occur in the first act of the play something whose real artistic value may not be evident to the spectator till the third or fourth act is reached is the silly fellow to get angry and call out and disturb the play and annoy the artists no the honest man is to sit quietly and know the delightful emotions of wonder curiosity and suspense he is not to go to the play to lose a vulgar temper he is to go to the play to realize an artistic temperament he is to go to the play to gain an artistic temperament he is not the arbiter of the work of art he is one who is admitted to contemplate the work of art and if the work be fine to forget in its contemplation the egotism that mars him the egotism of his ignorance or the egotism of his information this point about the drama is hardly i think sufficiently recognized i can understand that where macbeth produced for the first time before a modern london audience many of the people present would strongly and vigorously object to the introduction of the witches in the first act with their grotesque phrases and their ridiculous words but when the play is over one realises that the laughter of the witches in macbeth is as terrible as the laughter of madness in lear more terrible than the laughter of iago in the tragedy of the moor no spectator of art needs a more perfect mood of receptivity than the spectator of a play the moment he seeks to exercise authority he becomes the avowed enemy of art and of himself art does not mind it is he who suffers with the novel it is the same thing popular authority and the recognition of popular authority are fatal thackeray's esmond is a beautiful work of art because he wrote it to please himself in his other novels in pendennis in philip in vanity fair even at times he is too conscious of the public and spoils his work by appealing directly to the sympathies of the public 
or by directly mocking at them a true artist takes no notice whatever of the public the public are to him non-existent he has no poppied or honeyed cakes through which to give the monster sleep or sustenance he leaves that to the popular novelist one incomparable novelist we have now in england mr george meredith there are better artists in france but france has no one whose view of life is so large so varied so imaginatively true there are tellers of stories in russia who have a more vivid sense of what pain in fiction may be but to him belongs philosophy in fiction his people not merely live but they live in thought one can see them from myriad points of view they are suggestive there is soul in them and around them they are interpretative and symbolic and he who made them those wonderful quickly moving figures made them for his own pleasure and has never asked the public what they wanted has never cared to know what they wanted has never allowed the public to dictate to him or influence him in any way but has gone on intensifying his own personality and producing his own individual work at first none came to him that did not matter then the few came to him that did not change him the many have come now he is still the same he is an incomparable novelist with the decorative arts it is not different the public clung with really pathetic tenacity to what i believe were the direct traditions of the great exhibition of international vulgarity traditions that were so appalling that the houses in which people lived were only fit for blind people to live in beautiful things began to be made beautiful colours came from the dyer's hand beautiful patterns from the artist's brain and the use of beautiful things and their value and importance were set forth the public were really very indignant they lost their temper they said silly things no one minded no one was a whit the worse no one accepted the authority of public opinion and now it is almost impossible to enter any modern house without seeing some recognition of good taste some recognition of the value of lovely surroundings some sign of appreciation of beauty in fact people's houses are as a rule quite charming nowadays people have been to a very great extent civilized it is only fair to state however that the extraordinary success of the revolution in house decoration and furniture and the like has not really been due to the majority of the public developing a very fine taste in such matters it has been chiefly due to the fact that the craftsmen of things so appreciated the pleasure of making what was beautiful and woke to such a vivid consciousness of the hideousness and vulgarity of what the public had previously wanted that they simply starved the public out it would be quite impossible at the present moment to furnish a room as rooms were furnished a few years ago without going for everything to an auction of second-hand furniture from some third-rate lodging-house the things are no longer made however they may object to it people must nowadays have something charming in their surroundings fortunately for them their assumption of authority in these art matters came to entire grief it is evident then that all authority in such things is bad people sometimes inquire what form of government is most suitable for an artist to live under to this question there is only one answer 
the form of government that is most suitable to the artist is no government at all authority over him and his art is ridiculous it has been stated that under despotisms artists have produced lovely work this is not quite so artists have visited despots not as subjects to be tyrannized over but as wandering wonder-makers as fascinating vagrant personalities to be entertained and charmed and suffered to be at peace and allowed to create there is this to be said in favour of the despot that he being an individual may have culture while the mob being a monster has none one who is an emperor and king may stoop down to pick up a brush for a painter but when the democracy stoops down it is merely to throw mud and yet the democracy have not so far to stoop as the emperor in fact when they want to throw mud they have not to stoop at all but there is no necessity to separate the monarch from the mob all authority is equally bad end of section five recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey